I am Elizabeth Rohr, MD. I am from South Lake, Texas, now live in Dallas. I am a victim of um, multiple levels of abuse and misconduct throughout the criminal justice and uh, court systems. I am a I have been at, at the receiving end of child alienation, family court, divorce court misconduct, uh, criminal charges which were trumped up. I have been in prison 638 days. I have uh, been subjected to police brutality, jailer brutality. I have been moved from jail to jail to prevent uh, appeals being filed because I was a pro se defendant. Uh, I've been subjected to attorney misconduct and judicial mi misconduct, just to name a few also the government corruption. Long and short of it was I married the wrong person and it took me approximately 20 years to admit defeat in my marriage. When I discovered that my ex-husband was going to continue to beat children and be psychologically and mentally abusive because we had two children in medical school and an eight-year gap before we had our other five children, I put, I attributed the behavior that was happening in the first two children because we were going through medical school and residency. But later when we had a better life and it began again when the children received the, uh, achieved the same age as the other one, I knew this was a problem. I um, tried to find ways to work through it and finally realized that it was irretrievably damaged and I needed to file for divorce. Uh, the key motivator was when he beat the hell out of our 16-year-old kid son threw him over a car and he almost committed suicide by car and I stopped him. A couple of weeks later, maybe a week and a half later, he, while I was out of town working, he beat the hell out of the, uh, he was then at that time nine and the seven year old for arguing over a Game Boy. The kid had marks from uh, being whipped with a cord. I had been to CPS, I'd been to the police, I could not get any relief for the, the violence. He was a wealthy man and he had power. I filed for divorce thinking that the legal system was the solution to my problem, which is a joke. <laughs> um, the attorneys decided to have a New Year's party rather than have temporary orders hearing, and I was forced to sleep in the same bed in the same house with a violent, abusive, now very angry man, 1,200 square feet. Uh, it took 90, it took till April to have separation orders. I feared for my life. The man had tried to have me killed. I told the police repeatedly I feared for my life. They poo-pooed it and ignored it. The 911 calls were, have vanished from South Lake's records. Um, my husband, when I began to start fighting back, systematically began to destroy me. He would tell the other physicians at the hospitals, oh, Craig, how's it going? Oh, fine, how's your wife, Elizabeth? Oh, I'm concerned about her. She's losing her mind, she doesn't bathe, she doesn't take care of the kids. I'm in solo practice, I'm isolated, I have no idea this is going on until 2000 when one of my fellow physicians came to my home to express concern about my mental welfare, at which point I pulled her into my home and showed her the hundreds of holes in the walls and the war zone that my home was. So I'd gone to the, to the attorney and told her that I feared for my life, my children were in danger, and the case was filed as irreconcilable differences. This went from bad to worse. I got a judge who was very much a man's judge. The case dragged on for 18 months because the attorneys always do an interview when you come to find how much you make so they know how long they can drag it out. The divorce was finalized. It started in December of 2001. It was finalized in January, I mean, July 1st of 2003. In between that time, I happened to overhear my ex-husband, my husband at the time, conspiring with his lover to set me up and take my children away because he was concerned about the amount of child support he would have to pay. That was in April 12th of 2002. A couple days later, he stood in the driveway and threatened the man who was driving around in South Texas and my nanny that he was going to crush me into the dirt, destroy me, take away everything I had, and harm anyone who helped me. I went to my attorney with these concerns, and he told me, oh, don't worry, that's nothing. In June, they were on my property in, in Paradise, Texas, seizing horses. I had been out of town working ERs as hard as I could to pay the $5,000 a month my attorney demanded. I had prepaid my farmer $15,000 to 
feed and take care of my animals. Unfortunately, in November of the year before, Dr. Saunders, my husband, and Carl Miller, my farm manager, had gone trailer shopping together for eight hours. I believe that a deal was struck because Mr. Miller took my money but did nothing for the horses. Furthermore, the Wise County Sheriff's Department was in on it because they came in on the property to check on the horses and left horses in fields with no food and water so that they could come back a week later to seize because there'd be dead animals. Fortunately for the animals, I'd come home. I hadn't felt good about what was going on. I went out to check and I found emaciated, nearly deaf, ponies and horses in places where there was no food and water. I got people to help me and we moved a lot of those animals home so they could be taken care of, my house in South Lake, and they were put up. I was subjected to seizures on both properties and then charged with criminal charges of animal cruelty. The ex-husband systematically used the courts and the legal system to destroy me so that when I did go to trial for the custody, I had not a leg to stand on. He had hired David Cook of Senator Chris Harris's law firm as his third attorney and I noticed the substantial change in how the court case was going once Senator Harris's law firm was on the case. We had substantial amount of property. We had 42.6 acres of land in South Lake where each lot sold for 250,000 an acre. I had a 600 acre ranch in Paradise which was about to be turned into a development in a couple years. So we had a lot of assets and the bottom line was um, the reason I decided to divorce was not just the violence, but the difference in values. People were important to me. Connections, relationships, things and money and power were his thing. And I could see what it was doing to our children and I decided that I'd be better as a single parent than as, as married to them, no matter how much money he made. The divorce ground forward. I was forced into mediation three times. One mediation went 18 hours with no food, no water, no drink, no breaks, at which point I finally gave in and gave away most of my property to simply get out of that room. Both of the attorneys apparently worked in collusion because he certainly did not represent my interests. The divorce was finalized. With a sigh of relief, I thought we could begin our life. Well, during the divorce, the, the judge had already shown his biased by splitting up my children, three of my children in one house and two of my children in the other house and they would meet on Wednesday for a couple hours and then they would be switched over like hostages. It didn't go well. It was very hard for the children. There was, um, I need to stop for a second. I asked the camera to be stopped because the pain has become, the pain is so awesome to be so railroaded, so destroyed, to have everything you valued, particularly your children, taken from you. An aside, a very important aside, is when my husband and I got pregnant with the first child, it was out of wedlock, we were medical students. The child was born the second year of medical school and he harangued me to death to try to get me to have an abortion. Up to the day it could no longer be legal in the state of Ohio. We married after the child was born the next day. My parents and I gave in to the pressure. The um, second child was born right at the end of the fourth year and again when he found out I was pregnant he asked me to abort that child. I can understand two medical students separate and single but once you're married and you made the commitment to one why would you do this? Every single one of my seven children he has asked me to murder every single one and I was a very giving loving person I kept making excuses for this man so I am or was an enabler I was abused and I was an enabler and it wasn't until I was removed from the system forcibly that I began to heal how can a person with this much education get allow abuse it's the frog in the pot of water it starts so gradually just like the corruption in the legal system starts so gradually. So, to make the long story short, the divorce was acrimonious beyond words. Millions of dollars of assets were wasted. Lives were destroyed. Allegations were made. I had a, a tr my husband had set a hearing to modify custody or something 
And when I found out we were having a hearing, I marshaled 23 witnesses to a, the abuse so that we could present it in court. And when his attorney walked in and saw all those people sitting in the antechamber waiting, they canceled the motion. He then systematically harangued every single one of those witnesses till they all backed out because they were afraid. Two of them were my children who were adults, the daughter 17 and the son who would have been 19 at the time, Brandon and Rachel. So now I have a divorce. Assets have been wasted, but I can now start my life, so I'm working. When the animal seizure comes, it causes trouble with my job. Media coverage everywhere. I mean, they didn't come with a warrant. They came with the Channel 8 news crew, the Channel 11 news crew. It was trial by media. And they didn't use any of the truth or facts. They didn't want to hear the facts. Divorce was completed and we began the process of trying to heal the children and put together a split family. The visitation was alternating. I was the custodial parent with visitation at father's house and then visitation at my house uh, with um, alternating split family. <clears throat> the uh, children would come to my home crying, please don't make me go back, please don't go make me go back. Um, they would show up with injuries that made no sense at all. I have pictures of my daughter who was three and a half at the time with enormous goose egg this size on her forehead with a cut and raccoon eyes which are indicative of a skull fracture. And when Scott, my boyfriend at the time who helped me pick up the kids so I would not have to deal with him and the woman he was with, asked her what happened. She said, I'm hurt. And, Dad, and he says, well, what did Daddy do? Well, he took me out for ice cream. She was told not to tell what happened. She was unwilling to explain it, and none of the others saw it. A couple weeks before that, Jesse, who at the time was five, had come to my house with 10 to 20 percent body surface abrasions all over his body. When I asked his older brothers what happened, they clammed up because they'd been told not to tell. And then finally, one of them blurted out and said, well, Dad ran over him on his bicycle. And I thought, when they said it, that Dad had run over him with a bicycle, that he'd, but he had run over him with an SUV. I asked if Jesse had ever been taken to the hospital, because if you get run over by a large vehicle, you could have internal injuries, spleen, liver, head. No, he was just, I had doctored up his wounds, and he went to bed. I reported this repeatedly to CPS. I was deeply concerned because he had beaten the hell out of the 16-year-old. The he started abusing him from the age of three or four onwards. You know, it was little stuff at first, you know, smack him in the mouth, uh, tell him he's no good, but it, it escalated. And um, by the time we had seven children, it had escalated to the level where I was fearing for their harm, uh, for their lives, that he would harm them in such a way that would kill them not just psychologically, which is truly the worst of the two. Um, the nanny was involved. I had a woman living in my home helping me with the kids. While we were in my home, during the divorce, she was helping me with the kids, and after the divorce, she was too. I was subjected to wiretapping, bugs, in my office, in my home, on my phone. Same stuff as uh, other people have told. I went to court one day. And I had the feeling I'd been wiretapped, so I had told Jennifer, the nanny, who was also a nurse at my office, I said, Jennifer, let's talk about a job in Houston. So we talked about a job in Houston which was non-existent and not real in any way whatsoever. A week later, in court, David Cook of Senator Chris Harris's office interrogated me for 10 minutes on the record about that job. That's when I had for sure that my house was bugged. My office and home kept getting broken into and nothing missing. That's how I knew that was going on. When I would hire someone to come and bug sweep, I'd get broken into a day before and nothing would be missing. And of course, the sweep would be negative. I was dealing with a man with a lot of money and a lot of power. 
So as I started to file with CPS because of fear for the children, it escalated more. The, 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 the cruelty cases stepped up. The court case with the property on the divorce stepped up. Um, the judge kept making rulings with regards to the property. Our divorce was mediated, which means that the judge could only adjudicate custody. All the property was mediated, which was a contract. Our property, he stepped in in April of 2003. Yes, April of, no, April of 2004, the judge, Judge Shipman of the 211th District Court in uh, Denton County, Texas, stepped in and violated the contract and ordered the property sold for like $8,000 an acre less than it was worth. I sued him in a federal district court and the case, the, the buyer dropped out and so it, I won in essence. But the mistake I made was that that was my divorce judge who adjudicated custody. And now I've made a huge enemy. A man who already did not like me now wished to cause me great harm. So, in 2004, I'm working a lot. I'm making good money. I'm, my husband had given me in the mediation the ranch with 600 acres because it had an $11,000 a month payment. And he thought that it would take me down and I would fail. Not only had I managed to make that payment every month, but I had accumulated $50,000 to look into building a house and a barn so that we could move out to the ranch so the children would have a more wholesome outdoor life. Because I had four boys and two of them were very active. That instituted another horse seizure. So now I'm charged again with the third animal cruelty case. Let me get my dates here. I also was having medical problems in the summer of 2004 and I had to have surgery in the summer of 2004. I was in the middle of the Wise County case which was grinding towards a conviction on the animal cruelty and I was in the hospital, out of the hospital, in the hospital and out of the hospital. I was rehospitalized twice. My husband, ex-husband, goes to the 211th District in Denton County and asks for a motion to modify custody. The motion to modify custody, I believe, was held on August 23, 2004, and I was given no notice. I found out one day before, um, which was typical kind of stuff that was going on. Um, I went into the court, and I was blindsided. The judge ordered the custody to the ex-husband because I was about to be convicted in the Wise County case. I asked for more time for the children. He gave me some more time. I had promised my children a beach vacation. I had been unable to do it. And keeping your promises to your children is the most important thing you can do. I took my children to the beach vacation. I headed to San Benito immediately to take them to Padre like I had promised. Um, He went to the house to pick up the kids, and of course I'm not there. There's many times when he had been days late with the kids. I never called the police. I was mad, but I didn't call the police. He immediately went to the South Lake Police and told them I had abducted the children. The South Lake Police told him that unless there was danger of harm, that it was a civil matter. So Dr. Saunders, Dr. Ralph Craig Saunders, MD, orthopedic surgeon in Dallas, Fort Worth, went to the office the very next morning and our oldest son, Brandon Saunders, was there working for him as a scheduler for surgery. He pulled Brandon aside and said, Mom has fled to Mexico with the kids and we're never going to see them again unless you help us. You're on probation and if you don't do this, I will get your probation revoked. However, if you do this, I will get you a car, I'll give you a raise, I'll send you to school, and you'll be off probation within a matter of weeks. Please call my attorney, David Cook. He's on the line over there in Arlington, and help him write an affidavit so that we can get a criminal charge. And he didn't say criminal charge to Brandon, so we can get the kids back, because we don't want to lose them. 
So Brandon Saunders was coached by attorney David Cook of Senator Chris Harris's office to write a falsified affidavit that he said I would kneel the kids down and blow their brains out rather than give them to their father. And this was months after uh, Andrea Yates had killed her kids. So they used that in the media. I was America's top 10 most wanted criminal for having my own kids on a beach vacation for a day and a half too long. I was arrested in San Benito by a SWAT team and my children were taken from me at gunpoint, I believe on the 25th of August. I have not seen them since. I was extradited from San Benito to South Lake and from South Lake I was taken to Denton County. This is where the jail abuse began. I was beaten, handcuffed so tightly that I had no blood circulation in my hands and could not feel my fingers for three days. I was subjected to medical treatment without consent, i.e. sprayed with lice killer all over my body which made me wheeze and made me have an allergic reaction. I was um, in that jail and fortunately for me I had the good sense when they asked me if I feared for my life to tell the jailers that I did. So they put me in solitary confinement which was a safer place for me with a man who had tried to contract a murder on me in 99 or 2000. I was subjected to all kinds of mental torture in the jails. I was refused water. I was refused food. I was refused um, pen and paper. I had no access to a lawyer for weeks. I um, was kept in a cell that was filthy and by that I mean that there was a an inmate in the cell next to me with known hepatitis and when she would flush her toilet the feces and urine would well up into my cell and cover three quarters of the cell and I was forced to clean it up with toilet paper or my bare hands if I wanted cleanliness in my cell. I was kept away from anyone who could see me till the bruises went away. Eventually I was bonded out. My bond was set at $150,000 and I was charged with interference with child custody. Not contempt of court, a felony. The FBI had been to my parents' house when the manhunt was going on and they told my parents flat out that I couldn't be charged with that crime unless I was gone for three days. But in Texas, the golden rule is the rule of law. He who has the gold makes the rules. Senator Harris is an extremely powerful man. Dr. Craig Saunders was making over a million dollars a year. He had plenty of money. When I went to South Lake to try to get the records of the 911 calls, they were all missing. I had found police officers' phone numbers in his phone book. He has bought people off. He's paid them. The corruption goes all the way to the bone in Texas. The sad thing was that Scott Wass, my boyfriend, who liked my children was trying to help them, hired an attorney for me. His name was Stephen War, and he was well known in Denton County as being able to rub elbows and get a deal cut because litigating had been killing me and so it was better to cut a deal. Stephen War met with me several times and finally he told me, probably a six months or a year into the case, which he only asked $5,000 for three felonies. Very fair compared to everyone else I've met. He flat out told me, he says, Judge Shipman is up for the federal judgeship in Corpus Christi and he has cut a deal with Senator Harris's office that if you are convicted and you go to jail, he'll get the judgeship. But if you repeat this, I'll deny it. In November, of 2004, having sat in jail for what, 90 days or so with no bond, or no affordable bond, I was forced into bankruptcy because I could no longer make that $11,000 a month payment on my property. And my property was placed in bankruptcy. A year before, because I feared for my life, because I knew my ex-husband, because I'd been trying to do it when I was married to him, I had formed a family limited partnership and I had transferred my share of all the assets to the Family Limited Partnership. 
I was deprived of my medicine in jail and I was taking Synthroid, a thyroid medicine, which is necessary for mental function and many other things. So my memory was bad and so was my ability to resist. So when I filed my bankruptcy from jail, the paperwork was incorrectly filled out showing all the property belonging to me, not to the family limited partnership, which led to a lot of complications later on in the bankruptcy. Um, I was eventually released on bond and began to go back to work. I had an office and I had many, many, many loyal patients who stuck with me the whole way through this hell until my license was taken and they could not see me. Um, I was immediately fired from all my ER jobs when the media hit the fan on the harsh cruelty and of course the arrest finished any chance of ever getting another job working for someone else. But I had my office so I continued to work for myself and I would get bounced in the jail for various things. The bankruptcy court threw me in jail for contempt of court when I refused to sign over the property because I no longer had the titles to the property. They were in the family limited partnership. I spent over nine months, no, I mean over 90 days under civil contempt a bankruptcy court in the eastern district of Brenda T. Rhodes court because I wouldn't give them the deeds to the property. They weren't mine anymore. A U.S. attorney comes to my jail cell in uh, Rockwall County and tells me, if you'll just sign over these documents, we'll release you and there'll be no criminal charges. Well, I'd been sitting in jail for a quarter of a year by now. And I said, all right, I give. And so I signed the documents to release the, paper, the property to them, and I was immediately charged with criminal contempt. Yes. And so I was tried in Sherman for criminal contempt and immediately convicted and sentenced to another 90 days at Carswell. While I was in Carswell, Chase Alexander, my third, son, third child, second son, calls his grandmother and tells me his father, he's a 13-year-old kid by this point. His father, who's 250 pounds and a bodybuilder and a wrestler, has beaten the piss out of him in the garage. The kid's like 120 pounds. And there's no one to help this kid. I was beside myself. I'm in jail and I can't help the kid. I'm the only protector they had. His parents are dead. My parents live in Ohio. Eventually I was released from uh, Carswell and I went back to work again and the uh, the interference with child custody ground on. After I had spoken to Stephen Moore at length about this and they kept offering me 14 months in state jail, two years in state jail, no real offer of any kind for a day and a half of extra time with my kids, I decided to go pro se because Stephen told me there was no way I was going to get anybody in Denton County to fight this case for me who was not corrupt. And he'd been practicing there a long time. He knew the players. The animal cruelty in Denton County from my property in South Lake where they seized the horses moved forward also. We went to trial first because as I was doing pro se, they, of course they were trying to force a lawyer on me, trying to force me to get a lawyer, insisting it was a felony, that I was an idiot to represent myself. I said, I know I'm an idiot to represent myself, but it's better to have an honest person represent me than a criminal. Um, the animal, cr animal cruelty trial ground forward and of course Every time it came up to a trial, it'd be a front page news story in the Dallas Morning News with my picture on it. So when we came to trial in June of 2005, I did the voir dire on my jury. There wasn't a single person in that jury who didn't believe that if somebody was arrested, they were not guilty. Not only that, but every single one of them had seen the animal cruelty stuff. I had a completely hand-picked jury pull. We went forward anyways. The trial was um, a farce. The prosecution got three days of leisurely uh, presenting pictures that had been doctored by the SPCA and testimony that was lies and all kinds of good stuff. And Judge Garcia nodding the whole time. His name, Judge Garcia, the third district, no, third 
County Court number three in Denton County. When it came my turn, I got one day. And we did a 14 hour crash course to force it. But I dragged it out long enough till the next day we got to do closing statements. Jury instruction was very interesting as well because the animal cruelty law is very clear in that it accepts livestock, i.e. horses, goats, sheep, and cattle are exempt from the cruelty law because they're livestock. And that's also the federal law. But I was never permitted to present any of that in court. When the jury was given instruction and I tried to bring up jury nullification, they called an immediate recess and threatened me with imprisonment. Then the jury instruction, they struck off the whole end of the law that held the part that was the exception, which would have given me a not guilty. And of course I was convicted and I was sentenced to jail. However, I had my appeal ready, so they had to let me stay out on bond. So then I begin to continue to work now on my remaining three child custody cases. The child custody cases, oh, 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 no, even better. I forgot this. This is key. At the sentencing, which was later, it was about two months later, maybe September, my oldest son, who had been avoiding me ever since the, the arrest, comes into the, to the room to testify in the punishment part where they tell what kind of person you are. And he gets up on the stand and he swears under oath and begins to tell a story that almost made me faint. And it woke up the sleeping judge. He says, he tells about father forcing him to sign this affidavit. I did not know this for two years, well, a year and a half. I did not know this. He admits to perjury. He admits to f crimes, felonies in the court. The DA hears it. She knows it. We go forward to trial anyways. Every motion I tried to dismiss the custody was denied. I couldn't get a chance because it was a railroad. When I went to the DA's office to try, try to file judicial misconduct, the DA threatened me and threw me out. When I tried to go anywhere else, I was threatened and thrown out. They followed me. They pulled me over. They ticketed me. They arrested me for tickets. They arrested me for not having registration or inspection. When you can't work, you can't pay. It's as simple as that. The, um, the, um, custody case was tried March of 2006 and again with all the hoopla and fanfare of the media I mean I was on the front page three different times during that week when I came into the courtroom with photographs of my children ready to start on the opening day a motion in limine was presented by David Cook and Chris Harris to block any of Dr. Saunders' bad acts as any reason for what happened in my case. So I couldn't show the pictures of my abused children. I couldn't bring any of my witnesses. Nothing. It was another railroad job, but because Stephen Moore had stepped down and he advised me off the bar, off the cuff, every day on what to do in court, I was able to drop the pictures of my beaten children into the jury gallery and let them see them. I believe that has a lot to do with the outcome. Every time I objected because it was violations of due process from the beginning to the end in the trial, I was denied. Finally, the jury went and they deliberated in the same kind of jury instruction. I was not allowed to be offered the um, three-day rule. I was not allowed to present that as a defense. The judge again refused jury nullification. I was not allowed to present that. Um, and during this trial, I had asked the judge to recuse himself three times. He refused to recuse himself and he had one of his friends from Fort Worth come up and hear it and he refused to recuse him as well. This is judge. The judge who did my divorce somehow out of 25 judges in Denton County became my felony judge. 
What a coinkadink. Something's wrong in the state of Texas. Something's very wrong in the county of Denton. Yes, what a coinkadink that Judge L.D. Shipman, who did my divorce, who was beaten by me on the property issue, became my felony judge. And I had sued him in a court, which is an open conflict of interest. During August of 2005, Scott and I went to our favorite Chinese restaurant and we got seated and five minutes later, Judge Shipman comes in and he gets seated right beside me with Bruce Isaacs, the DA. And the two sat there and discussed my case openly next to me. When I went to the DA's office, this is the DA, good luck getting anybody to do anything about judicial misconduct. Good luck. The judge openly admitted he's been friends of Bruce Isaacs for 20 years. No conflict of interest here. All this is long ago and far away now. Since then, the last thing I did was, well, right after the trial, I was convicted. The jury gave me probation. Instead of, con I went to the jury for punishment because I knew to go to the judge would be suicide. That I would get two years of state jail with no time of any kind. The jury gave me five years of probation and he immediately ordered me handcuffed and put in jail because I said, I believe this is a farce and I was slapped with contempt and given four months in state jail for contempt of court for saying, I believe this is a farce. The kicker is that when I came back, because they dragged me in in July for sentencing, he denied me nine months of the jail time I had spent in jail. And so if I get revoked on probation, I get to do nine more months additional time in state jail. Compliments of Judge Shipman. I don't think there's an ax to grind here. Do you? Is that, is that nine months apply to what you're saying today? I'm sure it does. But perhaps lightning will strike him and God won't say, damn, I missed. <laughs> Maybe. He's up for re-election right now. Well, I'm sure some geniuses will re-elect him too. Yes, they will. While I was in the jail, I was systematically denied legal mail, paper. Uh, I had to document. And eventually I started getting inmate requests I could get a doctor because the second time, ah, in March when he ordered me jailed, I was first thrown into Denton County, at which point they immediately took me downstairs and I was taken into the dress out area and they asked me if I had any allergies and I said, yes, I'm allergic to the lice killer. Please don't put that on me. I can't breathe. Oh, no, 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 you'll be fine. I'm like, please don't do this. Oh, I said, look in the records. Two minutes later, they come back and say, oh, we don't have any records. Your record says nothing in there. You can't find a prisoner's record who hasn't been there in six months and two minutes. Just hold this mask over your face. You'll be fine. They sprayed the lice killer on me, and of course, I immediately developed a full-blown asthma attack. I could not breathe. I turned blue. I fell on the floor. And they ordered me up. Get up. Get up. I can't get up. So they take out the taser and they shoot me with the taser. Not once, but twice until I seize. At which point they flip me over face down and I'm stripped because they've stripped my clothes off of me. And they uh, handcuff me behind my back. They slip a pair of pants and a shir jail shirt on me. And they drag me down the hall by the handcuffs, jerking me along the way. Throw me into the hole on top of the grate covered with feces and urine and left me there to die. They were hoping I would die, I believe. I, um, I was in there for an undefined amount of time, but I would say somewhere around three hours with no treatment, unable to breathe, begging for help. I was eventually put into a solitary confinement cell, and the next day a jailer brought me a phone so I could make a call. And the first thing I did was call Scott. No, actually, Darren Hudson of Hudson Glass, who was one of my friends who would take my calls, and had him call 911 to get me medical treatment. 
because they were denying me medical treatment. When they found out I had made a 911 call from the jail, they came in and hung up the phone and I was punished by another beating and further treatment of that nature. There is a 911 call out there of me and you can't recognize my voice. Um, so then I was in jail for several months till I was shipped to Dawson State Jail, but I got to take the tour of the Gatesville facility for intake, and then we were left on the dock of the jail at Dawson for an hour in 105 degrees in the back of a truck with no air conditioning. People almost died in that car. They have no consideration for prisoners. They deserve to be treated like garbage, and they are. Dawson State Jail is hell on earth in Dallas. You never see the light of day, despite the fact the law requires it. You're not fed anything that resembles food. It's all soybeans and swill. The food has saltpeter in it. You can taste it in the drinks. Um, the jailers are uneducated, screaming, cursing, swearing, threatening people. Um, Regular violence goes on between jailers and prisoners. I documented it all and kept it all, and I sent it all out as legal mail. Eventually, I was released from Dawson in October of 2006, at which point I was then promptly shipped over to Carswell for another 90 days of criminal contempt and bankruptcy court. Um, I got out of there in January of 2007, at which point I was done with the jail system for the moment. While I was in jail in 2006, the state board decided to take my license without notification. So now I'm totally unemployable because I can't even work for myself. I fear for my life because my ex is not done with me. He will continue. He has continued. So what I did is I was um, waiting for sentencing, I believe. Oh, no, it was probation, but the probation didn't start right away. So I tried to get jobs and work. I would worked in Denton packaging clothes for $6 an hour to buy gas to drive to work to buy gas. And I packaged videos, and then I began to do some catering. And um, long and short is I lived in a trailer with no air conditioning, no heat, no electricity, no water, with holes this big under the windows that was full of cat shit. We had to roll the carpet up and throw it out. I uh, bought sea food at Walmart and took the seeds out and put in a garden so I could eat. Scott supported me as much as he could. Any attempt to get my license back has been thwarted. I'm told that, you know, people do DUIs and other stuff, get their license back. People who kill other patients get their license back, but I'm denied my license for felony interference with child custody. The interesting thing was during the custody, the same thing that a lot of the other people were saying occurred with me. The court-appointed uh, people were very biased. Nancy Stark was our court-appointed uh, evaluator. She was drinking wine with Dr. Saunders and Carol and, of course, went to court and testified that they had a bigger house so they would be better parents. It's, it's amazing. It's truly amazing. Stop for a second. I need some water. With regards to my medical license, the assault on that began early, right after the uh, first horse cruelty charge. I was called to the board in uh, uh, Austin, and I had to go justify myself before the board with regarding the animal cruelty. And as I was reading through the board rules, the only reason you could take a person's license was for a felony or a crime of moral turpitude. So when I got down there, I argued my case before the board. And they were bent to take my license at that time. There was apparently a great deal of political pressure to remove my license. I did win that argument at that time because they could find nowhere in their own bylaws that animal cruelty was a crime of moral turpitude or a felony. 
but I knew I was given notice at that point that there was a problem. So when I was convicted of child custody, the felony, I received a letter in the jail from the board stating that the matter had been resolved and the case was dropped. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm going to get out of jail and still be able to work. Sometime in that period while I was in Dawson or I was down at Gatesville, I was revoked without any notice at all. So when I got out, I had no license and no way to make a living. Custody of my children. You know, I was working, I was ordered to pay by the judge at the, at the judgment in August of 2004 when he changed custody. I was ordered to pay $2,800 or $2,400 a month for my children's child support, which is reasonable because that's what he was paying. However, when you're imprisoned and you're not making a living, how do you pay it? And so it accrued, and it accrued, and it accrued, because the whole time I was, every penny I made went to the lawyers, to the courts, to filing fees, to survival. Anyways, after it was all said and done, I got out, and I was very, very afraid. I had been beaten, brutalized, totally ignored. I mean, the FBI came to the jail when I got enough complaints out about the sewage that I was finally moved to another cell where I didn't have to live in sewage but nothing more came of it. And I was subjected to reprisals by Denton County Jail because I filed that complaint. Uh, I have a motion pending out there that I can actually file a civil suit for it, even though the statute of limitations has passed because they never dismissed it. It's still sitting there. Yay. So, so I'm living in the cat, tr cat crap trailer, struggling to live. Finally, we were forced uh, to move to another, again, trailer with no electricity, no water, and I was arrested and taken off for something. I don't remember if that was the bankruptcy court. I think it was the bankruptcy court second contempt. So I did that little tour. And I, I, mean, I bounced in and out so much I looked like a rubber ball. I knew the drill, but you know, it doesn't matter whether you resist or submit, they beat you up if they're angry. And they like to hurt people. Um, so sometime during all this, without notice, custody of my children has been permanently taken away. I have never received any notice that I had my, what do you call it, where you take the ch childhood rights? There's a name for it. Parental rights, registration. Yes, yes. Um, I found this out when Chase, who is now 19 today, was ready to graduate from school. I, you know, my, cust my, my, my probation orders was that I was not to have any contact with my children. I couldn't see my children. I couldn't contact my husband. I couldn't go near the school, couldn't go near the house. Basically barred from any. And that was from 2004 on and it was never changed in any way. When Chase got to be 18 and I could see him, I went to the subway in Trophy Club and brought him a birthday cake and he got to see me for the first time. We did began to renew a relationship. When I lost him, he was 11. The others were 9, 7, 5, and 3. Um, when he was ready to graduate, he asked to come live with me. He walked out of his father's house the day before graduation and came and lived with me. He walked off the stage, handed his robe to his father, and that was it. I told him, I said, Chase, you really need to, yeah, he gave him the finger. <laughs> My, my son has an IQ of about 160 to 170. He's very, very bright. What he does for fun is mathematics at the level that makes me just drool. And I'm well educated. Um, but uh, he avoids conflict after being pounded into the pavement at 13 and onwards. He be when he came to live at my house, he began to tell of the horrors that I imagined were going on in that home. He was deprived of normal, normal things like food. You could only eat at mealtimes. When you're a growing boy, all you do is eat. I've already been through one of those. They were deprived of food. If it wasn't at the table during dinner, there was no food. He was deprived of food for lunch at school. Pack your own lunch or buy it yourself. He worked two jobs. He was working as a lifeguard at the Keller Pool, and he was working the subway and trophy club. 
To get to the Subway and Trophy Club, he had to traverse like 10 miles, including a state highway, on a bicycle. He nearly got killed several times by people running him off the road. And he would do that in a hundred and some degrees heat. They had many, many cars at that home, but the punishment for being loyal to his mother was to be deprived of computers, which he was into programming, to be deprived of games, to be deprived of everything. He was very motivated in school, and he asked to take summer school so he could get an additional mathematics and science course and was denied it. Why would you deny a kid education? This is the kind of stuff that went on, and he's continued. I, I am in counseling. Thank you to my probation officer, Jennifer Forrest, who is a real human being and a very fine person. She ordered me to counseling because she sensed that I was war-torn and perhaps needed some treatment for PTSD or whatever you might want to call it. And w during one of those sessions, I took my 30-year-old son and he proceeded to tell of the horrible traumas of his childhood and another time I took Chase and he told stories too. So I have been developing a, s a collection of documentation. Um, so I took Chase to get a passport because he'd been wanting to go to Europe. There was a, 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 a honor student go to Europe sponsored thing and he begged his father. His father's like, no, you don't do what I tell you. You can't go. So I said, well, let's do this. If you want to go, I'll encourage you. You're an adult, you know. So I went to the Denton County Courthouse to get Chase's birth certificate so he can get a passport. Well, he and I, I showed, I'm trying to teach him adult behaviors because he didn't even know how to get his own driver's license or change his bank account to his own name. They had deprived him of all the necessary learning to be an adult in the world. It was like, okay, you're 18, go. So we go into the courthouse and I show him, here's the form to ask for your birth certificate, fill it out, and we'll go over to the clerk. And he steps up to the clerk and she, he hands it to her and she looks it up and she says, you filled this form out wrong. He says, what do you mean? It's the woman you put in is not your mother. He says, what do you mean? I should know my own mother. She's right here. He says, and I said, what do you mean? Um, what's on the form? What's, what's on the birth certificate? She says, my, and I said, my name is Elizabeth Ann Rohr Saunders, which is what my married name. Is that on there? No, no. I said, well, who is it? Well, it turns out that somewhere in this time period, the court has changed the birth certificates of all my minor children to show Carol Fowler Boyd as their mother. Huh? <laughs> How can this be? <laughs> How can this be? The bankruptcy dragged on forever and ever. In 2006, which it was filed in 2004 in uh, November, in 2006, the trustee, who is Michelle Hoping Chow, who's married to the attorney, Mark Ian A.G., and I had objected there was a conflict of interest here, and the judge said, no, there's no conflict of interest, decided to sell our property. They sold our property in South Lake initially for $3.1 million, and then it's downgraded to $2.1, and they sold the ranch for $1.2 million. My debt was, was let's see, was it $1.2 and $3.1? Bottom line is it was $2 million left after all the creditors were paid. I never saw any of that money. The bankruptcy dragged on for another four years so the Mark Ian AG and Michelle Hoping Chow could pay themselves that $250,000 a year until all the money was gone, at which point they then closed it, which destroyed my credit for an additional four years. All in all, Texas sucks. The people of Texas are kind, good people. Some of them are pretty ignorant, though, because they're voting for these yahoos that do this. That's all I can say. I'm an Ohioan. We don't do business like up, that up there, or they didn't when I was young. They may do it now. So I was basically systematically deprived of my good name, my children, my property, my livestock, my reputation, my ability to make a living. And then I was tossed out on the street and told, you need to pay $2,400 a month or we'll put you in jail. You need to pay 
$10,000 in fines. Oh, that's another beautiful thing. When I did go for, for the sentencing, we'd had a changing of the guard, and Bruce Isaacs, the DA, had been voted out. And the DA from Dallas County, Johnson, had been put in. So when we get before the judge, the judge orders me to um, five years of probation, because that's what the jury recommended, but he could impose the penalty. And he ordered $50,000 in fines, 10000 for each child. The DA looked at them and said, you can't do that. It's only $10,000 for the crime. The judge argued with the DA, and finally they did a continuance. And two weeks later, I was ordered to pay $10,000. $10,000 might as well be a million when you don't make a living. <laughs> it might as well be a billion. It doesn't matter. I have done my um, probation faithfully, passed all drug tests, because I don't use drugs. I have not harmed my children, approached my children, done anything of that order. I've been able to pay some of my probation fees, and eventually my probation officer had them lowered. But I'm probably going to be re-imprisoned at the very end because I cannot pay the 10000 What else do I have to say? Everything that happened was a great deal wrong. I can't say that I haven't made mistakes. I made a huge mistake. I married the wrong man. I didn't divorce him soon enough. I believed that the law system worked like law and order. What a farce. It has nothing to do with law and order. Law and order is total fantasy. Um, I believed that lawyers, there were good lawyers. I don't think so. They're all part of the court system. They all have an oath to uphold the court, which means that they're all cronies in the same system, which systematically derive, deprives people of their property, their dignity, their lives. They take people's lives from them. I am a spiritual person. I am not a church-going person. I believe there's karma, and I believe that one day these people may be facing their accusers I believe that America is coming to a huge crisis. And when that day comes, whatever happens to them is justified and then some. That's all I can say about it. I have gone from being a staunch Republican to an anarchist. I'm sorry. They made me that way.